There are thousands of stories of the vast war at sea during the Second World War, gripping stories of heroism and of terror, and sometimes even of, of boredom. Stories of enemies sought and enemies found, and desperate life-or-death battles, often between small ships, far from home. On her seventh war patrol, the crew of the British submarine HMS Terrapin suffered the terror of battle. Grievously damaged, in enemy territory far from home, sometimes the drama of war is not just in the fight, but in the desperate struggle to make it back alive. The last war patrol of HMS Terrapin deserves to be remembered. HMS Terrapin was one of 53 British T-class submarines. Ordered in 1941 and commissioned in January 1944, she was one of the last of the T-class boats to see significant service during the Second World War. She began her first patrol in March off of southern Norway, but by the end of April was assigned to the Far East, proceeding through the Mediterranean and the Suez Canal. Between July of 1944 to the end of March 1945, the boat conducted five war patrols from a base in Sri Lanka before being moved to Australia. She left for her seventh war patrol from Fremantle on May 3, 1945, assigned to patrol the Java Sea. The T-Class were diesel-electric, designed during the 1930s to replace the O, P, and R classes. T-Class submarines were built around the restrictions of the Washington Naval Treaty, which limited the total tonnage of submarines allowed, and thus were deliberately built small, initially aiming for a displacement of only 1,000 tons, although the class would evolve greatly over the course of the war. Because of the requirements of the treaty, several compromises had to be made, but the T-Class was generally designed to combine long-range endurance with a powerful armament of eight 21-inch forward-facing torpedo tubes giving the class a large protruding bow. Terrapin was 276 foot 6 inches long, had a beam of 25 foot 6 inches, a maximum surface speed of 15.5 knots, and a range of 4,500 nautical miles. The normal crew complement of HMS Terrapin was 61, and since August of 1944, she was under the command of Lieutenant Robert Henry Brunner, who had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross in April. Terrapin entered the Java Sea via the Lombok Strait on May 11th. Crewman George Cudden told the BBC that crossing the strait represented risk. The Japanese maintained quite intensive patrols in the strait, from their base at Limbar on Lombok, since it was known to be the route by which submarines from Fremantle entered the Java Sea. In addition to naval patrols, there was a constant risk from the air. Cudden said the Terrapin was twice attacked by aircraft after clearing the strait. The boat ran into difficulty, running aground off of Java on the 15th. She was only able to extricate herself by, according to her report, blowing 15,700 gallons of fuel from the external tanks and firing two bow torpedoes while going full astern. Still, Terrapin found success, sinking two enemy vessels, a motor lugger and a coal-carrying schooner, on the 17th. Two days later, at a quarter after one in the afternoon, Brunner sighted the masts and upper works of a ship, west of what was then called Batavia, now Jakarta. Brunner moved Terrapin in to make an attack. The vessel turned out to be a small freighter, but as Terrapin moved to within 6,000 yards, Brunner reported that two escorts were seen, one on each beam of the target. Brunner didn't identify the type of escort, although they would have been small coastal vessels, such as the Type D escort ship, outfitted with depth charges for anti-submarine warfare. Brunner tried to run to the port quarter of the nearest escort, but could not get a good firing solution with his bow tubes. So he turned, firing a spread of three torpedoes from the stern at 2,500 yards. But, Brunner recorded, no torpedo hits were heard after the expected running time, so all torpedoes must have missed. Cudden speculated the sea was glassy calm and the periscope or the torpedo tracks were probably observed, since the target was seen, to turn away. Terrapin was now in trouble. Her torpedoes had missed those escorts, which now knew that she was there. Cudden told the BBC, the escorts turned toward us and came at high speed down those torpedo tracks. The submarine's best chance was to go deep, but there was a problem. Cudden told the BBC, the estimated depth of water in the chart was 150 feet, and Terrapin attempted to go to 100 feet, but hit the bottom where there proved to be only 57 feet of water. Her screws could be heard thrashing the silt loudly, and the motors were stopped. Quickly, the depth charges started exploding. Gunner reported five depth charges were dropped close, causing some minor damage. Cudden said all the lights were out, and the sonar stopped training. Ten minutes later, the log notes, five more depth charges were dropped very close resulting in serious damage, amongst that damage, to the pressure hull, forward. Cutton described the damage. The port side forward buckled to a distance of 15 inches. Terrapin had few options. Brunner reported it was obvious the escort knew exactly where Terrapin was. But attempting to escape would only have made them a better target. Despite the damage, Brunner decided to stay in the bottom and not make any noise, trying to escape with the hope of escaping after dark. 
That plan assumed the Terrapin would survive until then, and if it did, would still be able to move. Terrapin was in bad shape, Cutton explained. The forward part of the main pumping and flooding line was crushed. The tube space was evacuated and its watertight doors shut. Leaks occurred in the forward auxiliary machinery space and in the control room. Jets of water sprayed inward. Blue flashes and loud thumps were heard as seawater con contacted electrical equipment. While the small fires were quickly extinguished, Cudden notes that they diminished the finite supply of oxygen. Two of the submarine's all-important tanks, the quick flooding tanks and the forward internal trimming tank, were flooded, leaving in question whether Terrapin would, again, be able to surface. More depth charges followed, including what Brummer described as one on each side amidships. Cudden wrote that a charge was heard to hit Terrapin and slide down the hull presumably to rest on the bottom, its depth apparently being overset. The idea was terrifying. Depth charges are pressure sensitive, so the explosion of another depth charge nearby could cause the one sitting right next to Terrapin's hull to explode. It must have been horrifying in the dark, with the ventilation system shut down and the air growing stale and hot, not knowing if the next pass by the escorts above would drop the depth charge that destroyed the ship. Cutton said that every crew member must have been in the same state of terror as myself. No one said a word. We all played at being hard man, and the unforgivable thing was to show, or admit to, fear. Hard man in those days did not mean what it appears to mean today, when it seems to mean throwing one's weight around and punching people in the face. Then it meant indifference, real or pretended, mostly I think the latter, to hardship and danger. Finally, though, Brunner wrote, six more runs overhead followed, but no more depth charges were dropped. Most likely, he was nearly out of supply of these. Luck for Terrapin as it saved her from destruction. Two more charges, with Bunner described as probably their last, fell some five hours and ten minutes after Terrapin had first sighted the enemy mast. The two charges were, he wrote, again very close, but caused no further damage. Finally, at nearly eight in the evening, Bunner decided to risk surfacing the boat. Cudden said it was by no means certain that we would be able to do so in view of the flooding of the tube space. Terrapin blew its main ballast tank, Cudden said it was not initially possible to tell whether we were in fact surfacing, since all depth gauges were smashed. The sound of the sea splashing against our hull suggested we were, at least partly, on the surface, though very much bow down. The skipper cautiously opened the upper conning tower hatch. If the escorts were still waiting, Terrapin would have been a sitting duck. Cudden said the gun's crew clambered out to the main gun, though that would have availed us little if the escorts had seen us. Among the damage, Brunner listed pressure hull distorted forward and stove in on both sides abreast the forward torpedo tubes. All forward torpedo tube firing gear displaced and otherwise damaged. The torpedo tubes were distorted and leaking through the bow caps. The four hydroplanes were stiff to operate and could not be turned in. ASDEC, the anti-submarine detection system, and hydrophones were defective. Forward periscope top glass fractured and tube flooded, after periscope almost useless. Several leaks in ballast and fuel tanks. Nonetheless, battered as she was, Terrapin was still afloat, and luck was with her. Brunner wrote, surfaced at full speed ahead, saw the enemy just abaft the port beam, range about 5,000 yards, altered course, and left the area at full speed. Terrapin was not sighted by the enemy, decided to escape through Sunda Strait. But the straits were, of course, particular areas of Japanese patrol, and sighting a ship that seemed to be blocking the Sunda Strait, Brunner decided to turn east and make for the Lombok Strait. Crossing the strait while on the surface would be incredibly dangerous, as the Terrapin risk being seen by aircraft. During the night, the boat affected repairs enough to submerge, but the boat was, Cudden said, very heavy amidships and forward, and he said she could not be allowed to go deep because of the leaks. Any crossing of the strait would be risky, more so because the damage had disabled Terrapin's radio, and she could not report her position or request help. Radar was still operable, powered by its own small generator. Cudden notes that Terrapin detected aircraft several times and had to stop each time as the boat's wake would have been the most obvious to aircraft. Terrapin was crawling home, but the dangerous Lombok Strait was still ahead, and she was in enemy waters, some 2,000 nautical miles from Fremantle. USS Kavala was a Gato-class submarine, the first class of submarines to be mass-produced by the United States. Commissioned in November 1944, Kavala was already known as the luckiest ship in the submarine service. That title referred to the extreme amount of action the boat saw despite being commissioned so late in the war. Kavala's first war patrol had started at Pearl Harbor on May 31, 1944, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Herman Kostler, a 1934 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Just over two weeks later, while still transiting to her patrol point in the eastern Philippines, Kavala had made a radar contact. The submarine had happened to cross paths with a Japanese task force on its way to engage the U.S. Fifth Fleet in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. 
Tracking the convoy two days later, on June 19th, Kavala fired a spread of six torpedoes, sinking the Japanese fleet carrier Shokaku, one of the six Japanese carriers to have participated in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Kavala became known as the Pearl Harbor Avenger, was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Her crew had only officially completed training 22 days earlier, on May 28th. Not quite a year later, on May 21st, 1945, Kavala was 31 days into her fifth war patrol in the South Java Sea. Kossler's report described the patrol as arduous, and the Kavala had not yet sighted a single target worthy of a torpedo. Kavala was headed to Fremantle, the end of a long and fruitless patrol. But their luck had changed. Kavala had sighted a naval vessel, described as a destroyer escort or gunboat. Kossler had to maneuver around some sailboats, something which Kossler described as a little broken field running. He was attempting what he called an end around, angling for an angle of attack, when suddenly a submarine was sighted on the surface. The hunter had suddenly become the hunted, as the submarine was not American and assumed to be Japanese. Kossler quickly reversed course, hoping the submarine had not seen him, but he wrote in the report, he had already sighted us. The first target, the destroyer escort, the first vessel on the patrol that Kossler had thought was worthy of a torpedo, disappeared into a rain squall. The submarine that had been sighted on the surface, however, began signaling with its searchlight. The submarine that Kossler had assumed was Japanese was, in fact, the crippled HMS Terrapin. Terrapin informed Kossler that she was unable to dive or transmit. Kossler knew the risk traveling through the Lombok Strait on the surface. But the luckiest ship in the submarine service was not going to let her allies suffer that risk alone. Kossler wrote, We manned the 20mm, 40mm, and 250 caliber machine guns and prepared to assist Terrapin in shooting it out with any plane that might make an appearance. After the arduous patrol, Kossler noted that my crew liked this, but I was having a hard time building up enthusiasm. Kavala was taking a risk, and Kossler knew it. Maximum speed Terrapin could make was 14 knots, he noted. Best sustained speed, 12 knots. Kavala's fate was now tied to the crippled British submarine. Kossler wrote that he asked Terrapin if she needed anything or would like to send part of her crew over with us. She replied in the negative. George Cutton described that exchange somewhat differently. He told BBC that Kavala asked, do any of your crew wish to come aboard for a bath and a rest? The question might have been somewhat of a taunt. U.S. submarines could distill 2,000 gallons of water per day, while the T-class submarines were known for a shortage of fresh water. In fact, Cudden noted the shaking had stirred up the 18 months of sediment in the freshwater tanks, and what came out of the taps was cloudy and colored a grayish-yellow. Still, Cudden said, Terrapin's CO declined, saying that morale was 100%. At four in the evening, the pair looked as if they might have to test their guns against an airplane as a contact closed within 11 miles. The plane didn't respond to IFF, meaning interrogation, friend or foe, suggesting it was an enemy plane, but, Kassler wrote, much to our relief, the plane opened up and distanced from sight and radar. The pair attempted to transit the strait after midnight. Kossler was apprehensive. His report read, Moon, too bright. Sea, too calm. Sky, too clear. Visibility, too good. There were tense moments. Kavala made a radar contract and moved to avoid it, but Terrapin didn't get the message. Terrapin maintained course and speed, he wrote. Must have passed fairly close to the contact, but nothing happened. So guess it was a sailboat. By 10 the next morning, the pair had safely transited the strait. It was only then that Kavala could come alongside Terrapin and Kassa wrote to obtain all the dope on her troubles. Later that morning, Kavala was able to make contact with its task force headquarters and report on Terrapin's condition. Crew from Kavala assisted with repairs, and Kossler sent over a sea bag full of stocks and some cigars, hoping they would give their morale and appetites a boost. The pair of submarines made it safely to Fremantle on May 27th. For HMS Terrapin, it was her last war patrol. The damage was too great to be repaired in Australia, and in July she was sent back to England, again transiting the Suez Canal, but when she arrived at her home port in Portsmouth, she was determined to be too damaged for repair. She was scrapped the following year. Upon arriving in Fremantle, the submarine tender HMS Maidstone sent a message to the officers and crew of Kavala. Thank you for helping our small boat across the street. Vice Admiral Carol Smith, commander of Submarine Squadron 30, commended the officers and crew of Kavala upon completion of another arduous patrol, which provided no opportunity to inflict any damage to the enemy, and for the excellent job of escorting HMS Terrapin. She finished her sixth war patrol off of Tokyo and joined the fleet that entered Tokyo Bay on August 31st. Placed in reserve, she was reactivated and modernized in 1951, and not stricken from the Naval Register until 1969. Since 1971, she has resided at Sea Wolf Park on Pelican Island, Galveston, Texas, where you can still visit her today. 
The two submarines had seen very different experiences in their respective war patrols when they chanced to encounter each other in May of 1945. Sometimes the drama of war is not in the damage inflicted on the enemy, but in the assistance that is rendered to a friend. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.